John, uh, no, not John. Revelation chapter 4. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you a picture of a scroll with seven seals. And uh, the seals are not jumping up and down on the scroll. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Lord Jesus opens the scroll with seven seals beginning in chapter 6. Now, I don't think we'll get that far tonight, but this is just an anticipation for what's coming. Scrolls could be 20 to 30 foot long. The longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls is a copy of Isaiah. It's 24 foot long. Okay. So let me go to the next uh, slide here. And uh, my apologies if that makes you hungry. That's not a tortilla with some pepperoni on it. <laughs> Yeah, that's what, uh, uh, it, uh, it, and you know, we don't know for sure exactly that this is what it looked like, but this is pretty close to probably what it looked like. The scroll with seven seals, and uh, the, the seals may have been inside the scroll, so that when you opened uh, one scroll, or one seal, you got to see part of the scroll, and then you open the next seal, you get to see some more. Yeah, yeah. But this gives you an idea of what it would look like. And so, how? I mean, why were they just a paper? I mean, what do you think? Um, it's kind of hard to tell from that picture, but uh, probably a foot or so. I'm just speculating, but that's. And I've seen some in museums, but it's been a while. So, yeah. Okay. So that's really all I had to show tonight, but I'll go ahead and leave that up there. And I'm sorry, I didn't probably make you hungry for pepperoni sweet. <laughs> so I want to just do a quick, well, let me ask you first, do you have any questions before we begin? <laughs> I noticed that the guy on the, the new version recording, I guess you'd say, one, one day he started out uh, saying uh, almost the same thing that you say, that he said, I don't have all the answers, I just want to know, I'm just trying to figure out the truth and I just want to know what the Bible says or something similar to what you've said before. Anyway, I just thought it was a nice way to put it. Yeah. I mean, he was saying it, it, it might be wrong. And I appreciate that, too, when others say that. it's uh, um, it, To me, this is one of those areas where it's just not clear or we'd be, there'd be a lot of agreement about it. And, and there's a lot of symbolic language here, and I think that's part of the, part of the issue. And we're kind of removed from the, that, that was 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So we're not as familiar with some of these symbols. And uh, so appreciate that. Any other comments, questions before we start? Okay. So I want to just review kind of where we are just real quickly. Uh, Re Revelation 119, I believe, gives us the structure for the book. And it says there, uh, John is told, write the things which you have seen, I believe that's chapter one, the things which are, I believe that's chapters two and three, and then the things which will take place after these things, and that's chapters four through 22. So uh, the vision of the, the prophecy uh, of the future begins with this vision of the heavenly throne. So Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2, says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and the one sitting on the throne. Now, I think chapters 4 and 5 serve as an introduction to the book with seven seals. And 
It's my understanding a book with seven seals could only be opened as, it, as each seal was broken one by one. Okay? So uh, John ascended into heaven spiritually. I don't think he went there physically. I think he went there spiritually. Uh, that's uh, what I think it means here when it says uh, immediately I was in the spirit. Okay? And uh, I agree with Dr. Patterson I don't think there's anything in the text here to indicate the experience of John was symbolic of the rapture of the church. It's okay if you want to believe that, you know, that it's symbolic there, but I don't see any evidence in the text that it is. And of course, there's various opinions about that. Now, I want to say a word about symbolic language. Uh, John will use even more metaphorical symbolic language as he goes on. And this language provokes the imagination. Now we're used to movies where they have special effects and they can provoke the imagination, you know, in exciting ways with movies and these special effects. At this time, they didn't have movies. All they had were writings. And uh, writings also can be, um, you know, can provoke the imagination. And I think that's part of what we're to understand here from, as we look through this, this was part of the design of the book of Revelation to uh, kind of get us excited about what's going to come in the future. And so, um, the revelation of the future opens with a vision of the throne of heaven and the revelation John receives is only possible because of the one who is worthy to open the seals. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. According to Revelation 5, 5, he's the one who opens the seals. Now, only God can reveal the future. I mean, if I knew what was going to happen next year at this time, for sure, I'd know where to invest my money. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I tend to be rather cautious with investing money, and uh, I don't get a high rate of return. Uh, I try to be cautious. Uh, only God knows the future, and he's telling us what's going to happen, um, and I haven't got all the details worked out. I don't think anyone else has. But I do know that our Lord is coming back. I think we can all be in agreement on that. And I think we all need to be ready for it. And I think that's part of what this book is uh, designed to do is help us prepare for that day when he returns. So um, no one knows the future except God. And our Lord is the one who is, who is, uh, uh, the only one worthy to break these seals so we can know what the future holds. Now, uh, I just kind of want to add this here. Many people will say, I, I, I cannot believe there's a God who exists who is all loving and all powerful because there's so much pain and misery in the world, suffering, if God is all loving, why does he allow that to happen? If he's all powerful, why doesn't he stop it? So they refuse to believe in God because they're, he's not doing what they expect. On the other hand, uh, if God wants us to be beings that choose to love him, we have to be able to choose not to love him. Uh, he could have created a bunch of robots that just said, yes, Master, we love you every time he, you know, called out our name. But he chose not to do that. He wanted us to have a genuine love relationship with him. Actually, I would say that it's, uh, that part of the reason I believe what the Bible says about God is because it's what we do not expect. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, 
the God of this universe did the unexpected. He created a world in which sin could take place and people could destroy their lives in sin. But then he became a man in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, born in a feeding trough. That's where his manger was. They had to move the animals out of the way so he could lay in the feeding trough. And he is born to, humanly speaking, insignificant, poor people that could not find a place to stay the night the baby was born. All the sin of the world is placed upon him at the cross, and he rose from the grave. Uh, this is what I would not expect the creator of this universe to do. To me, this is uh, unexpected. Um, and then he tells his disciples to go out and love others as they would love themselves and to preach this gospel of love, even to sacrifice their lives if necessary. Again, that is not what I would expect the creator of this universe to do. Let me put it another way. If someone wants to make up a story and try to get you to believe it, I don't think they would make up this kind of story. It's just too unbelievable. So it's so unbelievable that I believe it, if that makes sense. It's so unexpected that the creator of this universe bows down to wash his disciples' dirty feet. It's amazing. It's so unexpected. That's part of the reason I believe this what the Bible teaches. Question or comment before we move on? Okay. Vision of the heavenly throne. Let's go to verse 2. It says, I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Now, I think we kind of get uh, a little bit lost here because we may not be assured of exactly what these stones are like. This is my understanding from what I've read. Uh, this jasper was probably a clear stone in contrast to jasper stones today. It may have resembled a diamond. The carnelian was probably a ruby red color and so uh, it's my understanding the jasper and the carnelian were the first and the last of the 12 gemstones worn on the high priest's breast. And so this was a beautiful, beautiful vision he was receiving. And this rainbow around the throne, encircled the throne, would have been beautiful and amazing. And uh, the green color of the emerald would have added to the beauty. That's kind of what uh, I'm picturing in my mind here, that it's just more beautiful than we can imagine what he's seeing when he's seeing this. Question or comment about that before we move on? Okay, well, let's go on to the 24 elders around the throne. Uh, there are only about six different views if I, <laughs> about these elders. And, uh, but you can kind of narrow it down. It's kind of like there's three views that they're humans and three views that they're angels, okay? So now we've narrowed it down a little bit, two broad categories. So uh, let me just, you want me to go through all six or just kind of give you uh, in summary, what I think it is and why. Well, just a brief way off it says. The, the brief, okay, here's the brief analysis. Uh, so, the 
Some would say these men are either representatives of Israel, representatives of the church, or both. That's the three variations of human representation. Yeah, it's representatives of Israel, representatives of the church, or representatives of both Israel and the church. Okay. Um, so others would say the angels are representatives. These are angels. These 24 elders are angels. And they are either uh, representative of the priestly order of angels uh, the, and, and uh, or the faithful, the angels represent the faithful of all ages or they're a special class or college of angels. So that's the three angel views. Uh, there may be some other slight variations, but that's basically the six, the six views. And, um, and I actually agree with Dr. Patterson in his analysis of this in the New American Commentary I think the idea that these were angels are highly improbable. And I'll share some reasons why. Uh, nowhere in the scriptures do we find angels presented as elders or wearing victor's crowns. And it says here they were wearing golden crowns on their heads uh, there's nowhere angels are described as wearing golden crowns. So I think these elders represent redeemed and glorified humans. And in fact, uh, Dr. Patterson says, and I agree with him, that the 12 sons of Jacob would represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles would represent the church so you've got all of the redeemed of the Old Testament and all of the redeemed of the New Testament represented by these 24 elders. Represented except for those who have not been through the tribulation because the tribulation hasn't occurred yet. You follow me? That's still going to be future with the breaking open of the seven seals. Even for the ones that were in the pre-tribulation, they don't go to the That's what you're saying? Yeah, uh, so the, the pre-tribulation rapture view is uh, that uh, tribulation hasn't occurred yet. So what Dr. Patterson would say is, uh, so the church is in heaven during this tribulation period because uh, these uh, 12 elders the, the ones that represent the church, they're already in heaven. Well, uh, that sounds reasonable, except, uh, so you've got believers on earth in Jesus during the tribulation period, but they're not part of the redeemed of all ages. So, um, so maybe the redeemed here that are represented are the ones who are not in the tribulation period yet. Because whether you say it's 144,000 Israelites who profess faith in Jesus, or whether it's that they represent the church, however you want to phrase it, they're, they're still believers in Jesus. And they're not in heaven yet. They're still on the earth in the tribulation period. So I, I still can't uh, uh, think that... Uh, you know, you still have believers on earth during the tribulation period, however you want to describe them. So these 24 elders do not represent them according to uh, the, the pre-tribulation view because they're, they're, not, they're still on the earth. They're not in heaven yet. So it must not be the church that's, that's on earth. It's, the church must be in heaven. But you still have believers in Jesus on earth so, uh, so 
you're going to say those aren't the church. It's not the church, but they're still believers who are not represented. Uh, so I, I think the simplest way to solve this is to say that all of these uh, 24 elders represent all the redeemed of Israel, all the redeemed of the church up until the time of the tribulation. And then if you want to say it's just, uh, uh, you know, the Jew, whoever is in the tribulation period, they are believers in Jesus who come to faith in Christ and they preach the gospel. And you can say, well, they're not part of the church. Well, <laughs> to me, they still are. But uh, in other words, uh, I agree with Dr. Patterson until the time he says, you know, th this is all the redeemed of the church. Well, you still have people, you know, it's not the church in the tribulation period because the church is represented by these 12 apostles, these 12 elders, but you still have believers during the tribulation period. So it, it's, uh, I, I don't quite follow his thinking there when, when it gets, but I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. And I'll share with you some more reasons why I don't think these are angels. So here's part of the reason. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the 24 elders are not likely to be angels. If you go to Revelation 7:11, take a look there. And it says, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne. So you've got the mention of the angels, the elders, and the four living creatures. Now, if elders are simply angels, why are they specified differently here? And I think certainly the four living creatures are not elders or angels because they're listed separately. And we'll talk more about them in a moment. Also notice Revelation 4.4 4 says, around the throne were 24 thrones and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments. Now, if they were clothed in white garments, that suggests that they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That's part of what this idea of uh, the white garments suggests. Redemption by the blood of the Lamb. There is no indication anywhere in Scripture that angels can be redeemed. There's not. So, now, let me throw this in there. Matthew 12, I'm sorry, Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. You might want to make note of this. Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Jesus made a promise to the apostles that each of them would sit on a throne in heaven. And this will occur in the regeneration, when Jesus sits on his throne. God never promised angels would sit on thrones, but he promised the apostles they would. Now, in what sense will the apostles judge the 12 tribes? Well, the word judge can mean more than governing or presiding. It can also refer to someone who holds a distinguished place of honor. So in the Old Testament, you have the 12 judges uh, who ruled over, uh, or, uh, you know, Deborah was a judge, others were judges in the book of Judges. Is it in the book of Judges? <laughs> I believe it is, yeah. So uh, they are distinguished, honored for their, what they did in their lives. This is one of the ways the word judge is used. In John 5, 22, 
And Jesus says, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he's given all judgment to the Son. So my thought is that the, uh, the apostles and the, and the, uh, uh, the 12, uh, uh, you know, the 12 sons of um, Israel, that they represent the places of honor. They are honored above all for what they've done in their lives. Uh, not that they're perfect, but they receive honor. I think that's what it's, it's indicated here by the sense that they will be uh, judges. Yeah. Uh, again, I could see where someone might take this differently, but that's, that's kind of the way I, I think um, uh, the, the ancient judges were people of distinguished courage, patriotism, honor, and value. So, so I think these 20, 24 elders uh, represent, uh, uh, again, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, and that's the 24, representing the redeemed of all mankind up until the time of the tribulation because that had not occurred yet. Now here's something else that uh, in Revelation 5, 9 and 10, and uh, I'll be interested to see what your translations say at this point. This is, I'm going to read to you from the King James. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the scrolls thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred, kindred, and so forth. And verse 10, and has made us into our God, kings and priests. Is the word us in your translation? That was the King James. Us in the new Mexico. Pardon? Are you talking about in verse 10, us? Yeah, is the word us in there? No, no. And that's because um, the word us is not in many of the text of Revelation. So it's not included in most of the newer translations. If someone has a translation where it's included, I'd be interested to know. Uh, yeah, that's Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Now, if that was in the translation, again, it's only humans who can be redeemed. So, uh, on the other hand, I don't, if, if there's the word us is not there, I don't think it matters because I think there's enough evidence to say that these 24 represent humanity, redeemed humanity. But um, uh, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Question or comment about that? Yeah, the word us is not in some of the oldest. Well, in verse text. 11, listing the living creatures, elders, and it was talking about the voices in there. Okay, another question or comment? If not, let's go on to the living creatures, the four living creatures. Okay, Revelation 4, verse 5. Out from the thrones come flashes of lightning and sounds and pearls, peel, pardon me, peals of thunder, 
And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I've already shared before, I believe that's the Holy Spirit of God representing the Holy Spirit. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion and the second creature like a cat. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of you, they, your will, they existed and were created. Now, on the back of the handout I gave you is a description of the four living creatures in the book of Ezekiel and the four living creatures in Revelation here. And there are some slight differences. Uh, Ezekiel says they had four wings. Revelation says six. Now, that could be, you know, angels are able to apparently change their appearance. So it's possible that they change their appearance. Another possibility is that Ezekiel counted four wings and John counted six on these angels. So it's just difficult to know, uh, but the faces are the same, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. The eyes, there's multiple eyes on each. And so uh, again, it's, uh, I don't think we ought to think of these as some scary creatures. I don't think that's the intention. Uh, I think what they probably represent is creation. Uh, and some have suggested, uh, your translation may say beast, four beast, uh, living creatures, living beings, living ones. Uh, it could be translated this way. And I think what it's expressing is all of creation by these uh, uh, the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle. I think you could say that represents, the lion represents the, cre the wild creation. The ox represents the uh, domestic creation. Man is, of course, the human creation. Eagles, everything that flies in the heavens. So this is part of the suggestion, which I, I hold to. Um, and this is, uh, again, all the living creation. Now you may wonder, well, is the creation under a curse? Would you say yes or no to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would say yes. Uh, Genesis 3, 17 through 19, just in verse 17, cursed is the crown because of you, God says to Adam. So this world is under a curse. This creation is under a curse. Uh, I personally think that's why we have spiders and all those bad bugs out there, because we're under a curse. Uh, so, uh, both thorns and thistles, verse 18, it shall grow, grow for you. I think that's why we have thorns and thistles. So, all right. Is there a redemption of creation coming? Yes. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 18 through 22, and let me just get to the, the good part here. Verse 19, 8, 19, that for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, 
not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So I think we've got uh, the angels, the 24 elders representing redeemed humanity, and creation itself is pictured here as praising the Lord. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. But if you have some comments or questions, feel free. What are the other opinions on the four living creatures? Uh, you know, I'm not real sure what the other opinions are. Uh, that's that's uh, Uh, Patterson, Paige Patterson says, interpreters usually have evaluated this description as four segments of biological life. And then he kind of uh, shares what I shared there. So are you saying they were angels? Well, these are, uh, they're, they're explained, thank you for asking that question, they're explained in the book of Ezekiel as being cherubim, which is a certain type of angel. So these are apparently angelic beings representing uh, creation. That's my understanding. But if someone has a different view, I'm open to listening to it. <laughs> so Patterson says the cherubim in some ways represent all of God's created species. And I think that's, uh, that's correct. So, so John receives this glimpse of heaven, and this is preparation for the book with seven seals in chapter 5. And we'll get to that next week, Lord willing. Another question, comment? Again, I can say I don't know again. 